Hello, Ruby Khan. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Just under a year ago today, um, around December 13th, I started learning Ruby um, in order to learn Rails. Um, who's a Rails developer in the room? Wow. Who's not a Rails developer? <laughs> My goodness. I had the feeling that all the Rubyists were like, no, Rails. Um, so, uh, so I have some people who are of the same heritage. Um, but I've done a whole bunch of projects in Ruby that had nothing to do with Rails. And I find the Ruby language very delightful. And I've had the opportunity amongst um, other projects to do some mobile development in Ruby. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, um, so just to get a feeling for the audience here, who has done mobile development? Raise your hand. Actually, that's a fair number. I'd say probably about a third of the room. Anybody done mobile development in Ruby? Oh, a handful. Um, and uh, of mobile development, iPhone? Probably most of the mobile developers done iPhone. Blackberry? A few Blackberry. Windows Mobile? Three. Um, Android? Ah, six or seven, maybe ten. Anything else? Web OS. Web OS. Anything else? The Palm. J2ME. All right, we got some. Server side SMS based applications. <laughs> All right, server side SMS based applications. So, you know, we may have some people in the room who are way more expert at mobile development than me. But um, I want to start out by telling a little story about um, a project that I did this summer. Uh, um, so one last question. Who here has done consulting or professional services? I'd probably say about half the people here. So this story might have some familiarity to you folks. Um, and the other folks might find it interesting. Um, so it was a little adventure in agile development, um, which is always a challenge when you have clients. And you know, generally, I found it easier to do agile development when I'm doing product development rather than doing, you know, engaging with a client, especially for something short. But um, you know, I regularly, I'm an independent consultant, and I regularly get calls for prospective projects. And often, the mobile projects are strategic, which is usually a code word for, this is not actually important, but I'm going to get points with my boss for having this conversation with you. So um, sometimes it really is strategic, but that is you know, an important, and they're actually planning to do something in the near term. But often, you have these conversations, and people are thinking about it. So um, I got on the phone with this guy. And um, pretty big company, uh, Fortune 15, actually pretty enormous company. And um, he you know, was one of the more technical folks that I end up on the phone with for a first call and um, actually had a pretty good idea for a mobile application. You know, sometimes you'll get these ideas that are, um, they have some big sprawling web application and they all want to squeeze it into a, you know, three by five interface and that's just not going to work. But this guy had like a really good idea. And um, so I uh, borrowed a trick from some of my Ruby friends and I suggested that we could, you know, pair on a project. And we could develop a prototype together. His team could learn. I could teach, you know, and then I wouldn't have to spend so much time writing a spec, and it would be awesome. So that resonated pretty well. And he said, OK, I have a meeting tomorrow. But um, you know, this is probably in the like, January time frame or so. So he got back to me the next day, and he said, the meeting went really well. We need a proposal. So um, we talked through the specific screens. And I said, well, this seems pretty straightforward. I think you know, we could do it in like six or seven days on the iPhone, another few days for the Blackberry. And he said, wow, really? I said, shit, I should have said longer. <laughs> um, but, uh, but he came back. And after yet another meeting with um, his execs, he, um, he said, we have a user conference in three weeks. And we want to do a prototype for that. 
And I said, well, you know, you are a pretty big company. Can you really move that fast? And blah, blah, blah. And we, you know, they actually managed to sign a contract in three days. And we got together. And two of their engineers flew out. And in San Francisco, we went from having a story of what this mobile app, what somebody was going to use this mobile app for, to a prototype on iPhone and BlackBerry that was fully integrated with their SOAP backend in 10 days. And it was really awesome and a tribute to a lot of the agile uh, development methodologies that I've picked up with this crowd and um, to the Roam Mobile platform, which I was working with. So with that introductory story, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the technology. Um, the, oh, I wanted to point out that um, typically I'm working with uh, enterprise customers who have this challenge, which is they want to reach all their customers. It's really not that bizarre a thing for people to want. However, it's a technical challenge. So um, those of you who know mobile development know that we are in this really kind of odd situation that's just very different from the desktop world, which is that pretty much whichever operating system that you're using almost dictates the language that you use. Now, there's some exceptions to that, but frequently, you know, like on Symbian, you can do it in J2ME, but then you have limited access to certain APIs. And, and you know, C-sharp, you can actually use a whole bunch of different languages. But that doesn't mean that you can do the types of things that we're used to doing on Windows and Mac, where you have a C++ app, and you wire in some libraries, and most of your code is identical across the platforms. And that did take us several years, many years, to get to on the desktop. If anybody, who's developed desktop apps? Probably 10% of this audience. Um, but that's what I used to do a long time ago. Anyhow, so this is the kind of situation that, the, uh, that um, companies are faced with. They want to actually reach most of their audience, but, um, but it's a technical challenge to do so. So this is where um, Ruby comes in. Um, so there's an opportunity for, um, for really solving these problems with a uh, cross-platform framework. And so combining Ruby with HTML and CSS, you can create something that has the same technologies across all of these different runtimes and shares not all of the code, because the UI still has to fit the form factor, and there are differences, but not in your application logic and not in the core features. So today I'm going to talk mostly about Roam Mobile and um, do some live coding, um, but I have backups on the slides just in case, and also about a couple of um, UI frameworks that um, I found to be particularly neat in working with iPhone, um, iPhone look and feel. So, um, so talk first about Roam uh, Mobile technology, which is called Rhodes is the client side, and then there's a server side technology called Row Sync. So Rhodes um, <clears throat> and Row Sync is really best for data-driven applications. You can develop those kind of applications really quickly. You've got local data on the phone um, that ties into all of the various, um, you know, the platform-specific stuff, and you don't have to deal with it in a platform-specific way. Um, and like I said before, the Ruby code is um, shared across all of your applications. And the HTML, CSS can often be shared, you know, certain platforms like Android and I, um, iPhone are both WebKit, and those are really easy to share code across, but then other phones are a little more challenging. So this gives you um, some familiar tools. So Rhodes is a gem. Um, there are some Rails-like generators that I'll show you. Uh, there's a lot of rake tasks that make building this stuff a lot um, more seamless. And um, row sync, the middle tier, is a Rails application. And, uh, and Rhodes is not Rails, but it has some things that are sort of barred from Rails and you know, picks up some tricks in terms of workflow. So one thing that is a little hard to grasp for some folks, you know, it's sort of, um, we do a lot of web stuff, um, so it's easy to think about having an HTML interface and think you're building a web app. But actually, um, the way that it works is, 
you know, this may be implemented in HTML. It doesn't have to look like it's a website. And in fact, it's installed like it's a web app. You get like an icon that you select and it opens your web, your, um, sorry, your native app. And it's just that the UI control is embedded inside the application. So it's being used for application UI, not um, to communicate over the network. And um, this is actually something that I've seen a lot of people use just in their um, regular you know, Objective-C apps or Java apps. In fact, uh, Laurent showed it the other day with Mac Ruby, um, you know, this application, the demo application that he built. Uh, because it's really convenient to quickly lay out some UI in HTML. And these days, there's an awful lot of designers who speak HTML and can lay stuff out, and it creates this sort of lingua franca of, um, w of UI design that we didn't really have pre-web. So I think there's a real opportunity there. So Rhodes has within the phone, within the, this native application, the same kind of MVC model that we see in Rails. So you'll have, um, I'm going to just point because I don't seem to have a mouse. Um, so you'll have a screen, and you click, the user clicks a button, and that will generate what looks to your program like a web request, but it's all internal to your native app. And it goes to a controller, and then the controller might access the local database on the phone, and of course it could access the uh, remote database as well, um, the sync server. And then when it gets data back, it renders a view which is um, HTML ERB files, and then that creates another screen of your app. So now we're going to write some code. And I say we, meaning me. Um, we don't even need that. So the Rhodes gem installs the Rhodes gen command, so I can just say rogen app, and we're going to make a little inventory app for our store. And it generates a directory with a bunch of files in it. You get a configuration file, some build specifications, your views, uh, rake file, and um, so you know, some other stuff. So I'm going to go into that, and then I'm going to create a specific model and the views that go with it. This is similar to Rails scaffold. So I'm going to make it a product model. And it's going to have, and these are, uh, I'm just going to pick out some attributes that map to um, this web service that I'm going to call um, later, if we get to that point in the demo. Um, so we have a brand, a name, a quantity, a price. That's about it. And it creates a configuration for that specific model. Um, and then the sort of the standard views that you might expect, uh, index view that would list them, edit, new, show, and a controller. And these are, unlike Rails, these are all grouped under um, a single directory. And then I can run a rake task to build it. Oh, before I do that, let me actually just fix up the start screen. I'm going to edit the config file um, because the, the, the first screen that you go to is configured. So normally um, it just goes to this index page, but just for a shortcut, I'm going to go to the product page. And that'll go to the product index page. So now what it's doing is it's actually taking my Ruby code that was generated, and I'll show it to you in a little bit, and um, binding the, that with the native code. And so some of the code gets compiled into Objective-C, and some of it remains Ruby bytecode that's executed in the context of this application. And, um, and then the HTML views are bound up with the application. And then it automatically runs the um, iPhone simulator that I have installed with the iPhone SDK. So this is my inventory app, and I can click on it, and I get my index page for my products. And 
I'll specify a product and make it a scooter. What's that? Oh, <laughs> rockets. Yes, that would be. That'll be our next product. <laughs> Make a new. So that's um, that's the Acme product, and there is my um, show screen. So um, so it's really those of you who've done mobile development um, might know that it's normally a little more time consuming to come up with an initial app. So um, so that's pretty fun. So now. I actually wanted to say, instead of ac just Acme, I wanted to say the product name. So let's see. Here, I'm going to skip over to um, another copy of this app that I'm pulling out of the oven. No. Um, this is actually the exact same thing. I'm just using this. Um, Never mind, I'm not going to use that because it's not starting up. So what I wanted to show you is I think it's easier to see the directory structure when you have it laid out graphically. So here are your views. And this is my edit view, which contains um, ERB, so HTML. Can you erase the font size? Ah, oh, yes. Here, actually, I'm going to just go to where I can edit it. So in my app directory, in my products directory, is an index.erb. And then I will make this bigger for you. There we go. Is that readable? Maybe? Yeah. All right. That's probably less readable because it wraps. Um, so this isn't that surprising, right? You've got, um, you've got a few things that might be a little different from a um, web page because of the layout. You want to have a toolbar and whatnot that are typical of uh, mobile applications. And here I have um, a link to helper, which is just name the same things as it is in Rails. and. Um, I want to specify that it's going to have a name as well as the brand. So this is um, just a little bit of embedded Ruby code amidst my HTML in a way that's probably familiar to everybody here. So then um, I can uh, wait, run iPhone, and that will rebuild my iPhone and um, generate, I mean, rebuild my iPhone app and generate the native code. It also cleans up the database every time because you want to sort of start from scratch. There's all sorts of um, ways that you can decide not to do that, but it's generally a good idea. So what do we want? Rockets this time? We'll have 52 of them. And maybe they're free. Yay, and now we have Acme Rockets. Um, what, no applause? <laughs> Here we go. So, so what we went through, so we generated the app. We generated a model, which is um, created the views in the controller, which we'll talk a little bit more in a bit. And um, we configured it, and we ran it. There are also rake tasks for most of the different devices. And um, the Row Mobile team is actually amazingly fast at churning out new helper stuff. So it was a little gritty earlier this year. Um, but it's gotten to be a um, pretty smooth workflow, and it's constantly getting better. And if we have time, I'll show you RowHub, which is a new, I, I don't know how to use this thing. <laughs> Um, I just got a chance to borrow the droid. Thank you. So, um, so yeah, this is it running on an Android, um, droid, Motorola droid. 
And you can come up afterwards. We we're going to have, um, or I might try to broadcast it if we have time. But the apps are generally um, pretty similar, but there's a, there are device-specific features, like um, the BlackBerry has this little menu that if you press the berries button, you get to see. Um, so you can specify the, those things. And then the iPhone, which I misplaced. Um, the iPhone has a toolbar. We probably all know what an iPhone <laughs> looks like. Um, but yeah, the iPhone has a toolbar. And it, you know, it could have this, the navigation panel or the um, toolbar. So I want to talk a little bit about sync. Um, which is optional. You can build something that's completely client-side on roads, um, but sync features are pretty cool. And having done some um, client-server sync stuff in a past life, it is pretty um, time-consuming to get all that code right. So it's nice to be able to just use this. Um, this there's also a generator that will let you um, generate the boilerplate, which is these. Um, these specific touch points that you'd expect for sync. So there's login and log off, which are optional. You can just have blank implementations of those if you don't require authentication. And then query and sync go hand in hand. Query checks out your back end, and then sync gives you an opportunity to fix up the data if you want to. Um, and then create, update, and delete um, are basically an opportunity where the client will call the server with the um, records that are new or changed or deleted. And then the middle tier, your source adapter here, calls your web service with whatever protocol that, um, that that service works with. So it's pretty neat because I can be offline and you know, be modifying my little database here and changing things and be out of range. And then when I'm in range, the creates will go up to the server and then my code will be able to sync up with my back end. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about um, the, uh, the actual query, uh, just to give you a taste of what it's like, you end up with you know, really like a page, page and a half of code. It's pretty straightforward code to write, especially if you already know Ruby. In fact, I know a lot of people who don't know Ruby and come try this out, and it ends up being pretty straightforward even if you're brand new to Ruby, which is kind of a neat aspect of the Ruby language. So you, in this case, I am um, up here is my JSON. You probably can't read it, but I'm sure you all know what JSON looks like. Um, which is, you know, comes from this mock service that's written in Rails. But it could be SOAP or it could be um, XML or whatever. Um, so then in this case, I've implemented this query method, which get, opens the URI and um, pulls out the JSON and then um, just iterates through it and turns it into this other format. So basically, um, RowSync can, um, if you hand it this hash of hashes where you have a unique ID and then name value pairs, it will um, keep track of all of that and update your device with what you need. And then um, on the device side, you get these simple data structures that then you can pour into your views. And these Ruby objects are actually pretty easy to work with on the client side. So then um, just a, a little detail here. I just want to give you the flavor of what it's like to do this. Um, if you're running your own RowSync server, um, you would then configure the source adapter and configure the client to point to that source adapter. And, um, and then you're off and running. So I want to dive a little bit more into the human interface. The uh, controllers. Um, or look very much like a Rails app would. You, um, when you're doing a, like a product.find, um, you can pass in parameters that are any of those attributes. And you can put, get them together in an array or a singleton. And then they get handed to your view. And you deal with them in, H, in ERB just like you would in a Rails app. And then we talked about the ERB in the coding session. So, um, so if we have time, I'll demo that a little more. But I wanted to touch on um, some of the toolkits that we've experimented with. One of, so there's, there's probably, like, at least when we looked at this in August, 
there were about 25 different toolkits that did some iPhone special looking thing. And most of them implement like two or three controls or a couple of animations that aren't really that much more than jQuery. Um, but some of these two stood out as ones that are particularly interesting and fully featured. And you can actually use them together, and we've done that. Um, iWebKit has native looking iPhone widgets, so it's got a really nice collection of widgets. Um, here's most of them. Uh, and you end up wanting to have these gra graphical elements, and they're not that hard to build, but it's awesome that um, these kids in Sweden or Denmark um, have created them, and, um, and it's open source, it's LGPL, or you can buy a commercial license if people you work for don't like that. And then JQ Touch um, is made by um, Natobi, and it's also open source, and it creates native feeling iPhone UI. And um, we've got an app up here we can show you afterwards that um, does the, you know, all the slidey swooshy stuff that you like to see. So you can end up, even though you're building your app without, you know, all of the native Objective-C Coco stuff, um, you can end up having it feel like a genuine app. And really, that's a tribute to um, the strides that Apple has made with the WebKit browser. And, um, and it's great to have these toolkits so you can sort of quickly build this with the velocity that we expect to see from web application development. So um, I think I've been pretty speedy. What time is it? Excellent. So um, is everybody up for a quick demo? All right. So um, if we have internet connectivity, it does show like three bars. Um, I want to show you Rohub. Because what I showed you just now was really quick in terms of building a um, mobile app. But this is even quicker. We'll go to my Rohub account. So and the neat thing about Rohub is in addition to the generators that it's got a, um, a GUI for. So we'll create an application here. And this is a hosted service by Rohmobile. And if your, site, it's, if your app is open source, then it's free. And you can pay to have private apps. So um, we'll create a. Um, we had an Acme Store app, and we'll say that um, Roadrunner, it's not really Roadrunner who shops at the store, it's um, Wiley Coyote shops here. What's that? Roadrunner shops in the city. Really? Yeah. I missed that from, oh, I'm not supposed to put spaces there. I did watch that, but maybe I just missed that little piece of the action. OK. So we created the, um, this, the uh, Acme store. And now I'm going to create my, um, my model. So we'll make another product, just in case. I'm going to make an Acme product. I don't know how many millions of products I can have on the, my little Rohub account here. Um, And just like I did in the generator, I'm going to give it a brand and a name and a quantity. And a post. And I'll create that. And I think this is a, it's a little slower than it usually is. And this is, it has actually a hosted IDE. And I could see all my code here. I can actually go right here and do a build right now. Um, maybe I'll build the whole app right now. Get my cheat sheet just in case. Um, oh, no. We'll see how it goes. I'll talk about it while we wait for the network. Um, 
So here it gives you all of the stuff that you would normally have in the web interface of your roasting server that you might build. And, um, and I'll make the config change. And I'm going to go right into changing the server. It reminds me that I don't have users subscribed. Um, help me remember to do that. Save the changes. And right here I can modify my source adapter. And I'm going to write some query code. What was I going to do? Oh, I want to... Um, I've got a required JSON, and I'm going to use open URI. And we're going to open this uh, store, which is at, it's hosted at Heroku, rostore.heroku.com. And I know you can't read that, so I'll just read it aloud. And we'll go to products.json. I can barely read that. And um, then we'll do something with that. So I want to declare it up here so it's available outside of scope. Okay, so I'm parsing the JSON file, which is coming in with my list of project, products. What this query function is supposed to do, query method is supposed to do, is um, create an at result instance variable. So I'm going to go through the parsed JSON and... Um, Turn it into this other format, which is just a couple lines of Ruby. So we're going to take the items from the product object. It has an ID, and we're going to use that as the hash key. And um, it needs to be a string. And then we will assign the value, which is really what I'm going to do is just use all of the attributes that come back. But this is an opportunity if you wanted to, like sometimes you end up working with these SOAP APIs that have like this enormous amount of data that you don't want to go to your little tiny client. And so this is an opportunity for you to throw out the data that really is redundant or not necessary or not relevant to your mobile interface. And um, if I've typed that all right, um, we'll be able to check to see if it works. So I'll save it. And you have this little tester here where you can just show the records that came from, um, put that? Yeah. came from your web service just on the server or so before you bother to build your client app. And I have a syntax error. Too many closing brackets. Ah, good call. Anything else? Does that look okay? All right, we'll see how that goes. I still have errors in my code. Oh, because I have another, I, have, I just got crazy with the brackets. No, I need that one? No, that one, this one? Oh. Oh. 
Ah, oh, the document saved. All right. So now we'll check it. And I got records. Whew. Okay. So these. <laughs> Um, so these are the records that come from my web service, and now I can um, build the mobile app. Did I? I'm, it's a good thing we're like, you know, what would you call, you know, group programming here. It's the Acme product. Yes. All right, so now we'll see if we can. Uh, there, there is this new fancy thing, um, and there's one for Windows and one for Mac. And on the Mac, um, you can download this iPhone launcher, which is actually this little um, app that runs on your Mac that will um, automatically launch and relaunch the iPhone simulator with what it's downloaded. So it just saves you the you know, the extra steps of copy this, unload that, put that in there, um, and it turns out to save you a tremendous amount of time, so. So, I have several of these. Um, I just want to view by date modified, just to make sure that I'm doing the right one. Roads one through three. And there's my app. And there are my Acme products. Yay. And this you can use just as a starter and download the code and do it offline if you prefer to work in your own editor. And it's a great way to just you know, get started on something. So, um, so now if anybody has questions. I didn't see it when you ran the, uh, the road gen, but does this have facilities for testing? That's a really good question. Um, as far as I know, nobody has done that yet. So, um, so that's something that I'm really interested in, but, and it's theoretically doable, but it hasn't been done yet. How about does it integrate? Oh, wait, wait, did we have a follow-up comment? Oh, I was just going to say, RoseSync has a uh, test framework that was actually contributed by a third-party developer, Robin SP, from Sweden. Um, and uh, so doing some form of TDD within roads on the client is, is now a priority. We'll get to that soon. So on the server side, there's, you can do the test framework stuff, but on the client side, it's still an innovation to be had. Yes? How well does it integrate with Xcode? Like, can you uh, use the debugger and all the performance tools? So yeah, you can, um, I actually, before they had this iPhone launcher and Rohub and all the rake tasks were all worked out, um, I would routinely work in Xcode. And one of the reasons I decided to spend time learning Rhodes was that because it's all open source, it means that if there's some, you know, if there was some iPhone specific facility that I wanted, I can just build it in Objective-C. Like I've done a lot of proprietary stuff where as soon as you, you know, get to, you know, there's a bug or there's a feature missing and you, then you just hit a wall. and you can't deliver what you want to deliver or create what you want to create. The neat thing about the whole thing being open source is, you know, I mean, it is more time consuming, but it's, you know, it would be to build it in Objective-C in the first place. So you can dive in and, you know, it's documented how to do that. In the back. So what is, how does this relate to Apple's license agreement for the iPhone that you're not allowed to have interpreted code? Well, Apple doesn't want you to download and interpret code. So if you, internal to your application, happen to have some bytecode that you're interpreting, that's not an issue. The issue is that it doesn't, Apple doesn't want you like sort of distributing applications and executing them in your application. Other question? How would you uh, get this to the, uh, the iPhone store? Or, you know, the, the, the Distributed or whatever, is that possible through? It's a real app. Like on my machine, I have the same, like I have that thing that Xcode built. 
And in fact, you know, for code signing, you have to open up Xcode and put in your signature, and that's actually, um, you know, it's a straightforward thing. It's just there's a lot of little silly steps you have to go through. But it's the same steps you'd go through if you had built your own app natively. And the same goes for every platform. In fact, I should mention um, Vidal and I and um, Lee Lundrigan are working on a book. So um, I was actually inspired by Dave um, Chelinsky's RSpec book, which I found great value of when it was halfway done and really enjoyed reading and found that it had information that I couldn't find elsewhere. So we're working on a book and it, the four chapters are done that cover, um, that cover most of Rhodes and the iPhone and the, the vision behind the, um, the book is that it covers the native development for each of these different platforms so that you can understand how it would be to develop it natively and that you have all in one place all of the code signing connections that you have to go through. And then um, it'll cover um, how you would do the you know, cross-platform stuff in Rhodes and then this other JavaScript-based framework called PhoneGap and, um, and some of the UI toolkits. So a little plug for our book. Um, but it's up on the APRES site. So other questions? Yes? Has uh, Apple Store any com 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 compliance about the code generated for the road gem? I mean, do you can put your application built with road in Apple Store? Yeah, there's a bunch of um, apps that are on the store. I mean, like you can, the Wikipedia app, I think, um, um, what's his name? Hampton um, spoke about at, you know, sort of, a little bit at um, Golden Gate Ruby Conference, he took, um, he, he made an app in Rhodes that he oh. submitted to the App Store, and there's a whole bunch of apps on the App Store, so it hasn't really been an issue for Rhodes. Yeah? Can you include um, other standard Ruby gems? Can you include other standard Ruby gems? Do your views in Hamlet instead of in ERB? So, um, I, I think so. You can just include Ruby stuff. That? that uh, we offered that to Hampton, and he said no, it, since it's all about being small and tight, he actually liked the fact that it was ERB, so he, and he could have <laughs> added Hamel, and he just stayed with ERB for it. So, um, so I have, um, helping me in the audience here, <laughs> Adam from uh, Row Mobile. No, thank you, Adam. Raise your hand if anybody has questions about how Rhodes is built. You can bug him afterwards if you have questions about how to use it in the wild. Um, Vidal and I have a lot of experience building apps. So I'm going to pause there because um, I think I'm out of time. I want to thank my um, helper, Vidal Gropera. Um, we have a number of apps and phones here that you're welcome to come up and check out. And you know, feel free to come up afterwards if you have questions. Thanks. <laughs>